From the Twin Cities PBS Archives, a conversation with Steve McClellan, originally broadcast in 1991. For him, an average workday tends to run from mid-afternoon until 3.30 in the morning. He and his partner transformed First Avenue from a disc to a nationally recognized venue for progressive rock and roll bands. With us on Portrait, Steve McClellan. What have you learned at First Avenue then? <laughs> well, I guess I know more about the music business. Um, I guess I know more about people. I mean, that's actually, what have I learned? What has anybody learned in 15 years of experience? What have you learned about the music business? Oh, God. <laughs> How to sign contracts, book bands. But I mean, I guess that's, that's such a narrow focus question. What have I learned about the people associated around music business, I guess lots, you know, I mean, there's many good feelings, good people in the past, and there's many not so good feelings, good people in the past. And well, I, rather than just focus, I mean, the music business, just like I suppose any other realm of the entertainment business has some kind of a glamour gloss to it, and it's, it's really not any different in terms of why people stay in it, why people do what they do, I mean, what have I learned in the last 15 years? I, I would say it's been, I've been thrown into an area where I associate with people more in the music business than I do in the banking industry. Um, and I guess I, I don't see it as any, any glamour gloss to it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's well, what, what keeps you in it? I mean, what, what keeps you going back every day, every week, every year? Uh, I don't want to grow up. I don't know. It's it's fun. It's it's with all the frustrations and, and uh, runarounds. It it certainly beats other options. Dealing with actually very early, I understood what uh, when I first started managing the facility. It was run by a corporation, so there were district managers and vice presidents of finance and. And then in 1980, when me and a partner of mine went to the owner of the club and became our own bosses, kind of, it took a lot of the, what I did not like and what to this day finds me not wanting to work for any kind of large corporation with forms to fill out and social events that you have to make sure you don't piss off the vice president's mm -hmm. new girlfriend or wife or both. Um, I don't know. It's fun. The freedom, uh, the freedom's there, and the people are there, and it seems to be right. Yeah. What kind of, um, you know, what kind of vision did you and your partner have when you began it? In other words, how did you want to change what had been there, and what did you see yourselves creating? <laughs> I don't think there was any magnum, <laughs> any kind of large-scale vision at stake. You know, we needed to pay the rent, and uh, uh, this thing kind of got dumped in our laps. I mean, either the club closed, and we both start looking for real jobs or we could propose that we'll stay on at a lessened salary and then we'd get a check at the end of the month. Um, certainly it was fun uh, enough that there was motivation to try to put something together to keep the club open. You know, I'm not going to downplay that. But there was no l large scheme, hey, let's keep this club open for 20 years and have all the... Yeah. No, there was no grand. But what did you see yourselves doing in terms of trying to attract an audience and develop a clientele that was different from what had gone on before? I mean, you obviously must well, have seen I mean, yourselves we're as not capable of doing that. Anything that had been done. I mean, at that time, video was not anything introduced to clubs, so there was some kind of a video installation installed. And, and I think the concept of booking progressive music is not a novel thing. I mean... It's very easy to get bands nobody's ever heard of because the talent just needs to be seen, and if nobody wants to see them, they're not very marketable in the entertainment. Uh, as a sales commodity in entertainment, you need to have people want to pay to see you. So to do stuff progressive is very easy. You just have to cover the losses when 10 people show up on whatever the band costs, you know, so... And, and I think it's it's uh, being in a, in a downtown location in what is uh, Minneapolis is, is a, you know I mean I've always lived in Minneapolis and it's 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 a very good environment for arts of all you know and it's just not music and the music scene's always been strong in this market and this predates Prince and replacements who's could do I mean even the old Soma label that existed what I, I don't know when Soma was around 
but that was things when chancellors and trashmen and I, I don't know who all else at that scene. I was at that time I was just buying the singles, not a paying attention to the record label. Um, I don't know. It seemed right to not try to do uh, some kind of a cover band routine, or uh, mm -hmm. it, it seemed right to move into a progressive music stance at that stage, just because of the neighborhood. Well, do you I like guess, the music that you're booking now more than the music that you sort of grew up on? And that's no, I can't book the music I grew up on. It's either got too expensive or they're dead. Um, uh, do I like the... You don't think about stuff like that. No. No, you try to figure out what people want, not what you personally want. Mm -hmm. but, but you have developed a pretty loyal clientele over the years, haven't you? Oh! Uh, to, I, I guess in terms of nightclubs, yeah. But there you, certainly has been a lot of transition in crowds. Mm -hmm. There was the pre-Prince Day, the pre-Purple Rain Days, I guess is what you call them. And then the tourist Purple Rain crowds, and then that moves into the next crowd, I, I guess. And then people, you know, I mean, the early, early crowd, uh, we just did the special beat, which is the Angus Beach Specials reunion thing last year. And I saw people that hadn't been on the club in seven years. They still like music. They remember seeing the English beat there in 83, mm -hmm. 84. Um, and wh why aren't they coming down as regulars now? Well, they've done funny things with their lives, you know, like marriage, kids, jobs. You know, all of a sudden being out until 1.30 in the morning is not as productive in their ongoing activities. Uh, so, yeah, there's been transition in crowds. What, and, and there's so much transition in the, just in what, what, what is the market? What, what is a regular clientele? Um, you see shifts all the time. I mean, you say that's like uh, what every kind of record rep is trying to figure out. How can mm -hmm. we sell this to the masses? The big mm -hmm. crossover appeal. We don't want to be a black act. We want to cross over. Well, by and large, we want to sell more records. Um, I don't know. When you get into the market demographics or deciding what is a regular clientele, um, I don't know, that's why they got universities and they all put together these large texts of marketing demographic studies and... and what, what about your musical instincts? I mean, what, what do you think keeps them alive and fresh? <laughs> I don't know, I have any. Actually, um, I'm generally... But you're making decisions all the time in terms of who Yeah, you I'm book. making decisions based on people far in far better positions to give me their opinions. You know, I depend on, you know, I'm just an administrator, I'm not an administrator, I'm not a critic, I'm not a... I guess my whole attitude there is I've got DJs, soundmen uh, at the club that are far more versed in what's going on musically than I. There's from your, your alternative record stores to your alternative radio stations. Those are the people making it happen and are far better positioned to make judgmental decisions. But they're the, also the first variable on the scale of if the, something's clicking with them, they're the ones that's going to feed it to the whatever the street mm -hmm. level public is that's going to mm -hmm. come out and want to see the act. So, you, so you're listening to them all the time? I'm con I, <laughs> when I proceed without them, I am lost. What's, what's the worst experience you've had in terms of uh, acts that have come through? Worst? We're going to go into this technotronic. First of all, there's been a lot of bad, <laughs> bad music. Just bad music? Bad music. Yeah. And there's been a lot question that always seemingly comes up, and uh, it did, I know this is uh, City Pages Reader, uh, sent out a thing for people, I think it was City Pages that did something asking people their favorite shows over the 20 years. And it, it's such, it's one of those, what do you remember most, who you're with, that kind of scenario when you pick this stuff out. So it's, you know, there's certainly been a numerous bad and numerous good. Uh, I guess the technotronic uh, thing is bad. The word, the one I think of most, because when you're paying a band five thousand dollars, you expect something. Um, and I, uh, I guess I've told it in a, a technotronic big single, pump up the jam. They're getting paid five grand to do two eight-minute sets. Their eight-minute sets are not even eight minutes long, and they do a very bad version, bad meaning not good, of pump up the jam, which is their single, and they didn't want to increase it at all. The stage manager was trying, saying, "Hey, you know, I mean, maybe we can do an encore. Maybe you can get back up there." No, they don't want to. They, their feeling was that if they do much more than eight minutes, they lose the attention of their audience. You know, and the reason I said I look at five thousand dollars, and then I look at bands that have made less than that, 
bands uh, personal taste wise NRBQ, Neville Brothers, Dr. John, that can roll for two and a half hours and it ne it's always wonderful. And for this particular act to collect five grand and not be able to increase their six minute set to eight minutes, uh, I guess that would go. Uh, it's got to be one of the top ten worst things I've ever seen in a club. But, Were they um, at least polite or gracious as they left? <laughs> no. Remember, they're big. They moved on to the arenas. I think what happened after this particular tour, they got on the Madonna tour as the opening act. Uh, therefore, instead of playing measly 1,200 people, 800 people rooms, they started playing 65,000 people arenas and probably made at least 10 times. No, I can't say 10. I don't know what they made mm -hmm. at that level, but a lot more money. So they're even getting paid more for what I don't imagine to be a lot more. Mm -hmm. So I, that's... How about some of your best experiences? What, what bands? Oh, are there are there's best? so many to try to narrow in. You know, I bring up some of my personal music taste. It seems to lie in the blues. Yeah. Uh, you know, the NRBQs, the Neville Brothers, the Dr. Johns. But there's uh, so many been so many great like African pop, world beat stuff. I, I I tend to go back to my hippie days in college for the music that I've enjoyed the best live. Um, but a lot of the times, you know, it's like, yeah, doesn't he have a good job? He gets to, he gets paid to sit and watch concerts. Uh, on the average, I, I, I rarely, rarely get to see more than three songs in a row on any given set. Um, so the best shows that I generally see are not at the club, because then I can see them. You do go out to other shows then? Oh, rare. I just went and saw Richard Thompson at the Guthrie. Um, but I also don't like sit down venues like that. I got so, yeah. I'll I'll go out occasionally. For favorite acts or just um, just to get out. Yeah. What about um, the changing technology in music and uh, you know? <laughs> <I'm> doing... <laughs> we'll leave that one alone. How, well, how has that changed things? For oh, you? there's a lot more canned things going out on the road. I you know. Um, when it comes to questions of how technology has affected the music. I would ask the people that have to deal with it, which is the musicians. Well, how do you, has DJs. it affected the, the work in the club or your life in any way? I know your business. Only in the sense, no, not really. I mean, you just have to read what's hitting. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, see the things. I, of course, don't like to bring in things. You know, I'm a little bit, uh, in a sense, and I don't know if it's just that old hippie mentality or what. I don't like providing people with bad product. And I think uh, maybe being the traditionalist in terms of music, to me, live musicians doing real live music well is, is a highlight of a concert. So as more and more uh, drum machines and technologies allowing people to pre-program, and it, to me there's a sense of phoniness there, but that's my judgment. Kids are going out and buying it and showing up for shows, and it's changing. It's kind of like when I first started buying, let's see, my, my dad's record collection was like Frank Sinatra, Ink Spots, whatever happened in the late 40s, those big, mm -hmm. big records, the 78s 78, that would break yeah. me, threw me against the wall. Um, and so I was buying stupid stuff like Rolling Stones and Kinks and Yardbirds and Animals and Doors and... and you know, so now I'm beginning to feel like me. I'm putting Van Morrison tapes on my CD players, and people are putting your Jane's Addictions on. And certainly there is a generation gulf there. So I'm not going to predict what, you know, I mean, what new technologies. Uh, my job is again not to provide what I want. What about loyalty over the years? I mean, as a group comes through and uh, then goes on to make it, I mean, how often well, do you get people coming back? Again, this is a re redundant. And loyalty is a funny word when careers shift and people's lives shift and monetary situations shift and needs shift. You know, when you look at any artist that go, you know, I mean, there's artists that go through an agent a year. Those are the least stable. So every time you're doing the act, you're dealing with a different agent, so they never know the past history of the act in the club. So if you get an act three times through three different agents, I guess you feel pleased that your venue has outdated their own booking agent. 
Um, I guess a lot of the loyalty, yeah, it's out there. It's out there. It, it, there's a loyalty factor out there. And I guess what it comes down to is being at the right place, right time, right situation. Because again, you know, the, with the management shifts and the agency shifts, I mean, Sun Ra, uh, I use a specific example that's actually kind of irksome to me right now. I've always got along with the, the manager agent for Sun Ra. So the club has done Sun Ra like four times in the last 10 years. Well, he fired his manager. I don't know what happened here, but ended up with a new agent and is now playing another club in town. Actually, tonight. Tonight. And I feel a little burnt. I've never made money on Sun Ra. He's always put on a great show, but we've always had the opportunity to do him. Well, the agent response when I called and said, you know, I've done Sun Ra. We get lots of press on him every time we do that show. I never got a call. I didn't know he was coming back. And the agent response was, I didn't know he'd ever played Minneapolis. I mean, to me, this is a sharp agent in the business, really checks out his market. Actually, I think the agent was fully aware, but just had different loyalties, and the artist need not be aware of those loyalties and bypassed us. So I guess when you ask a question of loyalties, it's like the working relationships that go on in the business that are constantly fluctuating from management to record labels to, I mean, when you look at a musician or, or an artist that's uh, saleable over the years, um, I guess there's exception to every rule, but I doubt whether you'll see one that had the same management company, the same record label, the same booking agent, if they're selling a saleable commodity to those masses. Mm -hmm. You'll see some shifts. The ones that shift every six months are the least. And the ones that at a certain point in their career say, I need something different. I don't want to play clubs anymore. I want to do theaters. Um, I want an agent that can get me this. In the past, this worked all right, but my music is changing. I need to find an agent that deals with that change. So you'll see those kind of shifts in career. Mm -hmm. And then when you get into loyalty functions, as you know, I guess like any other career, one is allowed to pursue a path that takes them where they want to go, correct? So, um, I guess when you ask question of loyalty, what does it mean? You know, what does it mean? What about uh, cynicism? Have you grown more cynical over the years? No, I'm probably just as cynical as I was in college. You were never naive? <laughs> oh, very naive, very naive. I thought I went to the seminary in ninth grade because I was going to be a priest because I thought that would make the world right and just. These early 70s went through the political phase. Let's change. You know, if you're not part of the solution, you are part of the problem. Um, and so we went through the tear gassing and the, <laughs> and the political organizations and the leafleting and the bleeding heart. Mm -hmm. But then that all got mucked up, you know. Well, this isn't changing the world. We're just creating more laws, regulations. Um, no, very naive. What happened? I mean, how did that change over beyond well, the I've tear gas? By, well, I've kind of, by walking into music, mm -hmm. I'm not dealing with as vital issues as I was in, a, uh, in, say, the good old college days when you thought you were doing something and... Um, well, it was going into music an escape from the yeah. world? Yeah, it actually was. You know, you could com campaign uh, from a govern and be glad that Minnesota was one of the few states that almost, or I don't know how that went, boy, weren't our efforts great, even though it was one of the biggest landslide things. It was hard. You felt some sense of accomplishment that he did better here than in Tennessee. Boy, it's good I just put all those volunteer hours into that, right? Um, yeah, I guess an escape to a degree. Uh, the the issues. It is an escape. Music is an escape, which allows one to work with people in a way that you're having fun. Uh, and I guess I, I I got to if if naivety is something everybody grows out of. Uh, I guess you sit back and say, okay, what do I want to do with my life? I want to have fun because I'm not going to be any good to anybody else unless I'm feeling good about myself. So put yourself in a situation that allows you, and then you can help people. And then you can work with friends and stuff on problems. But if you're not happy with what you're doing, then, then you're not going to be much help to anybody else. Is there a real soft side to you? No. <laughs> None whatsoever. Don't like kids, don't like puppies. Oh, I'm sure there is. Um, I don't know what that means, soft side. Well, I mean, I listen to you, I, I, probably, I hear your business uh, side and your business rap, but then I also hear you talk about really enjoying the people you work with. Oh, yeah. 
No, I've always believed when you put yourself, if you go to, and that's why I always abhor the little glimpse that I have of corporate or large bu bureaucratic operations. It's, it's such a cold feeling. And I'd much rather work uh, with a group of people where people can be relaxed, free, and when you know they're mad, you know it. And they don't hide it, and you know when they're happy. You know, I mean, that, that makes living going to work fun. Um, the few experiences I've had with large structured operations is that you can never feel yourself. You go in and the house, yeah, it's, it's too cold. And that's a personal choice, and um, so you I get don't a regret lot it. Of, you get a lot out of the club then? Well, let's say I get a lot out of the people that, uh, in, in this particular path I've chosen. I've never chosen to take bands up to any higher levels, which is nothing but frustrated the agents that work with me. Because when you start getting to Met Centers, you start dealing with the union politics of union labor, you start dealing with all the masses of government. You know, when you do a 15,000 people room, you are far more removed from the actual thing of working with music. I mean, you can never see, you don't even have to know who's playing the show to fulfill your job. And somehow that takes the fun out of it. You're just playing games with whoever the state tax person is and whoever the... It, it, it all of a sudden takes it into a realm where if you had to do it 40 hours, 60, 70 hours a week, you'd, you wouldn't have fun anymore. Why are you doing it? Why are you spending so many hours doing something that you're no longer having fun at? I, I'm a big believer people should do. They should do things with their lives that makes them happy and then worry about the money and where it gets them as a result of it, not trying to put that first and find out they're miserable. Wealthy and miserable. And I, I, I guess I feel sorry for people like that. I, I don't know. How much longer are you going to stay in the business? Until somebody buys me like a resort up in the Boundary Waters with um, like uh, some cabins. and I'm waiting for like, I put in a grant for the federal government that I should be able to get this. And, uh, I don't know. I don't know. That's you getting burned out at all? I guess if, that's what the oh, question I'll is. burn out every three weeks. I'm burned out, and then three weeks I'm back again. You know, it's, it's the ebb and flow of the business. And again, I, I, people attributing it just to the music business is crazy because I can see. Just ask the stockbrokers when the crash occurred three years ago. The ebb and flow of the story. And I actually, just go to one of those stock exchange floors when people are yelling all during the day. No, I think this business has just as much volatility and just as much ease. Yeah, as the financial world, anything else. It's how you adjust what, what you like dealing with. I don't know. I don't know. Will I ever burn out? Yeah, I burn out every three weeks. But then I come back the fourth week and I decide that's what I like doing. If the club closes in a month due to Target Center needs another parking lot, then I guess I'll have to look for a job. I guess I don't think about that. I think I'll find one. I've made pizza before, and I've um, pumped gasoline before, and I've got a lot of experience outside the club. Um, well, Steve, I'd like to thank you very much for being with us here tonight on Portrait. Again, I do think this is a public health program to get management to stop smoking. But thank you. Is this done? Are we cut? I think so. Funding for this TPT archival podcast was made possible by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund.